Both my children are severely disabled. Um, Perlsky was born in 1992. Um, her APGARs were nine and nine, which is just about as good as you can get. She was in the NICU within an hour. Second or third day, they told me she'd never come out. Um, two and a half years later, we were pregnant with Joe. And he, uh, <laughs> when we were pregnant, I got a wonderful fax from a friend of mine who has since passed. And it said, courage has its rewards. Because everyone was rather nervous about us being pregnant again because we didn't know what was wrong with Pearl's King. And uh, did all the tests known to man, and Joe was supposed to be fine, which he wasn't. So both of them are severely disabled. And it wasn't until uh, probably two years later that finally we did find a diagnosis. And it was the first in the medical literature, an amino acid deficiency. It's an enzyme has gone awry in the DNA. Um, we don't really know why. We can trace back lineage from me and their mother, which we do come from a very small group of people hundreds of years ago. So we do have some commonality there. Um, since my children were diagnosed, other people have been. We know of a couple of dozen cases worldwide. Um, and we're able to treat it with the amino acid, uh, which keeps seizures at bay and does help in various ways, but they're both severely disabled. They need 100% care, non-mobile, non-verbal, just uh, both have uh, seizure disorders and global delays. Um, do, you wanna, do you wanna talk at all about why they're in different locations? Well, that was, it was tough. Um, when Perlsky was born, I spent most time with her because uh, her mother was working and I was able to work out of the house. And then when Joe came along, having both severely disabled, sort of like the care was divided. And that was just a natural thing. Okay, so I knew all of Perlsky's meds, I knew how to deal with her, and Joe, his mother dealt with him more. It became very interesting. At night, we'd have two monitors because they'd be in separate rooms, and I would wake up only Perlsky's, and she would wake up only to Joe's, which was really fascinating. Um, because in people, hearing never ceases, even uh, during sleep, as a natural protective mechanism. Uh, and then we got divorced, it was very amicable, but there was never a question. Never a question of how the division would happen. Um, it was just natural. I had bonded that closely with Perlsky, and um, so Joe went with his mother. About two and a half years later, though, uh, Joe ended up in a residential facility, and uh, Perlsky stayed with me. I would have kept both, and I wanted to, but logistically, just impossible. I would have ne needed full-time help in the house. So that sort of puts a crimp on one's life. Um, when they first were divided, Joe was actually, they were about two blocks away. And we even had walkie-talkies between the houses for emergencies, and it was nice. But then she got involved with a guy who didn't like being so close. I would see Joe every day on the school bus. But then things happened, and they moved across town, and it um, wasn't the best of situations. It was a very, very difficult decision but decided to just go with the residential facility. We did get one of the best ones. Uh, it was heart-wrenching. It's still very difficult. So he doesn't know me anymore. It's two and a half hours away. Doing a five-hour drive is tough. It's crushing to see him there. It's very, very difficult. So um, I go. I see him at all his doctor's appointments, which are back home. Um, but it just wasn't feasible for me to bring them, have them both in the house. We fail as parents all the time. Okay? Many of us fail when the doctor says, um, your child needs a G-tube, failure to thrive. Okay? When the doctor says failure to thrive, what you hear is failure to parent. If you can't feed your kid, you're useless. That's what we do as parents. We feed our children. Okay? 
Um, and just about every parent a week after the G-tube is in thanks the doctor and brings them presents because their kid is now, you know, turning pink as opposed to blue or whatever. So we fail as parents all the time and we continue to. Yes, Joe going to a residential facility was a tremendous failure, okay? He had left me, so Joe was taken away from me multiple times. He's taken away from me at the divorce, okay? Now, did I fight it? No, for reasons we've just discussed. He lived a couple of blocks away. I saw him every morning and every afternoon on the bus. I was able to walk there with Pearlsky. Uh, then he was taken away from me, went across town. Saw him significantly less. Before that, it was twice a day at least. Um, then he went into a residential facility. Now that choice was made because it was the best overall choice. It was not the best for me. Uh, probably the best for his mother and the best for him. Um, his mother fully rose to the, the occasion and became a wonderful mother to someone, to a disabled child who's in a full residential facility. Okay? You get the best of all worlds. It's like in any divorce, okay? The kids are no longer in a house with fighting, so a lot of fathers in a classical divorce where the mother has primary custody, the fathers have the kids every other weekend and every other night, and there's no fighting going along. Okay, they get the best, everyone's in a good mood, they have fun together, and it's easier. So it may not be the overall best situation. Um, and when Joe went to a residential facility, in some ways, um, his mother was able to relax, didn't have the, um, the fears that come along with the setting of the sun at night. Um, and I just dealt with it, I lost my son. Um, but life is so overwhelming with Perlsky that I sort of accept it. It makes it harder to see him. He has no idea who I am. It's tough. You know, I'll, I'll have guilt and feel awful about it till, you know, I'm dead and buried. I mean, there is no doubt about that. Uh, I don't have a son. Okay, it's, like I said, just, it, it's very difficult. Um, do I regret it? I don't know what life would be having both of them at home. I don't know how I would have survived that, even with full-time help. You know, full-time help comes and goes, okay? Um, you know, how do I find a better half who would accept that? Well, that's tough. Um, so, you know, yeah, there's some guilt, not too much regret. It's a hard one to separate. I don't know what either one of them knows. Okay, and that we can talk about for hours. Okay, I have no idea if Perlsky has the mind of a well, three-month-old. She has the mind of a 21-year-old. Most likely the mind of a five- or six-year-old, which is scary because five- and six-year-olds are kind of smart. Okay. Um, you know, I've discussed this with other parents. There's quite often times where we just wish that they're really retarded. I really sometimes hope Hannah, Joe, Chris, Perlsky, all of them have no clue what's going on. The thing that keeps me up sometimes at night, I don't obsess about it, but if it pops into my head, I'll be up all night. It scares me the most is running into her in heaven when she can talk. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to know what she says. Now everyone tells me, you're a great father, she'll say thank you. Her first words very well might, can I speak freely? It might be, fuck you, dad. Very well might be. Might be, thank you. May not be. Might be, why? It's a question I got for other people. Um, so I don't know what she knows. I don't know how she perceives the world. I don't know how Joe perceives the world. I believe there is something, okay? I, the problem is uh, I'm a scientist, multiple degrees in science. I understand biology. I understand why there's life and life created and everything else. Um, I also understand religion. 
I understand there have been incidences with my with well Perovsky that cannot be explained. Okay, she should have died about nine years ago. Something happened that can't be explained. So you know, yeah, there probably is a god. If there's not. Well, if there is a God, I want to believe in him and I want to do good. I want to do good by my daughter because I don't want to get him or her upset at me. And if there's not a God, well, I might as well try to be good anyway. I, you know, whatever. Um, but I have questions. So do I believe? Yeah, it's easier to believe than not believe, at least from my upbringing. And it gives you someone to blame, someone to yell at. When you stand there, and you're watching your daughter have a seizure and you know you're losing her. Her eyes are rolled back, she's turning colors. Are you alone in the room or are you there with your God? I don't like being alone. I cannot uh, keep caring for Perlsky into my 70s and my 80s. I'm 55. I blew out a disc two years ago and I was bedridden for a month. Um, there's going to have to be some point where she doesn't live at home. Um, that's not as bad as what happens when I'm gone. That's a whole different story, but it's in the same genre. Um, I do have the dream, and it's not really a pipe dream, to buy the house next door when, when Polly decides to move and sell it and turn it into a little residential home for the three or four of these children. That's a possibility. Um, you know, yeah, I want her to live forever. The other thing that that clergyman said, the God doesn't put on your plate gentleman, said that did make sense, and he said it like 19 years ago or something, he said, all kids leave when they're 18. That's what kids do. So there are times we need to remember the appropriateness Okay, and kids don't live at home. Now, yeah, they live on their own and she can't live on her own, but should she live at home? What about my life? You have to look at the mental health and the wealth, well-being of the entire family. That's important in all decisions with these kids throughout the years. Some of them are family decisions. Am I going to give her an extra dose of Benadryl tonight? Okay, or Valium. Is it moral, ethical, or are you doing it for the family? So, yes, I think about a residential facility for her. I think about it for about six, seven seconds, and then I get the thought out of my mind as soon as possible. I think about it as often as I think about what's going to happen when I die. And you're not allowed to now bring up that topic since I brought it up. It's been, it's been taken off the table. No, you can ask me whatever you want. Um, it's a difficult topic, but she will, I will not be able to care for her forever, and I know that. Uh, looking into adult day programs now, the one that seems most likely happens to have a residential program affiliated with it. That's a good thing. Right now I'm in Canada. I live in the States. Let's say I don't make it home. It's possible. The only people that really know how to take care of Perlsky are her nannies, two or three of them that have complete other lives. Can they teach people? They probably don't even know where I buy the amino acid because you can't buy it most places. So what happens? Um, she'll end up in a residential facility very quickly. The state will take over. She'll never be cared for nearly as well as things people will just have to figure out. Yes, I've documented things. You know, will it even be seen, the documentation? Um, will she survive without me? Yeah, she'll survive without me. Um, but the guilt, will her quality of life go down? Absolutely. Absolutely, her quality of life will change. And that's not me being so great. It's just how many of us have someone who adores us, who's with us every day. My mother taught me that word. 
when I was four, five, six, we used to play a game. And mom would say to me, I adore you. And I could hear her voice now, 50 years later. I adore you. Do you know what that means? And just, I would look at her. And either because I was a dumb shit or I was playing back at her, I would always shake my head no. And she would say, it's more than love. You'll understand when you have kids. So nobody's going to adore Perlsky like I do. Nobody's going to take care of her as well as I do. So if I put her in a residential home, there won't be people at night reacting to a gelastic seizure. They'll think she's just awake and laughing a little bit. Um, there'll be other issues. They won't understand her. She has no communication, yet I understand her. Um, so uh, the whole thing is difficult. Do I deserve a life? Yeah, I probably deserve more of a life, okay? Um, you know, do I sacrifice? Do I um, martyr myself for her? Isn't that what we do as parents? I mean, I've learned it's been a very difficult year. I can't protect her. Bad stuff's happened to her. Out of my control. But what point is being a father if you can't protect your daughter? I put her on a school bus every morning not knowing anything. What's going to happen? She won't be able to tell me. She's come back bruised. She's come back worse. So if I can't protect her as her father and I adore her, what's a residential facility with staff that turns over every year and everything else, what are they going to do? Um, so how do I go on and have a life? It's not easy. Okay. I can't do anything. I can't shorten her lifespan mm -hmm. and continue with mine. That can't be done. Mm -hmm. So we each define parenting. Um, and unfortunately, part of parenting, in my mind, is you protect your child. And as a father, I say misogynistically or whatever, protect my daughter, protect her with my life. And I would do that with the stepdaughter, and I would do it with Pearlsky. Um, there's only so much you can. But to just put her in a residential facility and walk away, that's... For me, that would be cowardice and that would be wrong. For other parents, if that's the best they can do, God bless them. I would stay with Perlsky in my house until the day I pass away, if that was possible. That day would be an interesting day. Um, it's not going to happen because I have to be realistic. I can't pick her up now. I physically can. In an emergency, I can pick her up, but it would have tremendous consequences. Um, so she won't be with me forever. Uh, ideally, she'll be within a couple of miles. Ideally, I'd be able to see her as often as I want. And like any other similar situation, that would fade away, too. I would see her every day, and then it would fade. Um... She's not typical. I can't go by when kids are 18 and they leave the house. Um, I can't live with myself knowing there's no one that will care for her like I do. And there is a lot of self-sacrifice in it. Not total. There are some times where a decision is made where I make it for me and, and she loses. Okay, uh, I can't think of anything specific, but, you know, uh, when things are minimal. Um, but, yeah, putting her in a residence now would be wrong for me. Going anywhere is difficult. Walking into Perlsky's school, and I do that every day. There are reasons I do it every day now. That was an agreement I made with her. Um, and I see typical young ladies. And, and boys, of course, I see. And that is still, to this day, extremely difficult. I walk into the classroom, and she's the lowest functioning. 
I get invited to Cinco de Mayo and Thanksgiving and everyone has their parents there and I'm in the special needs classroom and it's difficult because some of them have their siblings there who are typical or the parents and uh, so no I, I don't have a family unit. I've never had um, I very strongly believe that families, modern families, should at least have dinner together. If I had a typical family, as a father, I would insist that we all just sit down at least half an hour. So you don't even have to talk to me, you could throw your food, you don't have to eat. I want to see your face. I've never had a family dinner. You just can't do it with these kids, it just doesn't happen. Um, so family is tough. I have a very loving family. My, on my father's eulogy, I said, I don't think he ever knew his grandkids were disabled. Okay? Of course he knew. College educated, very smart man. But he had two grandkids. I was proud of them. Came over, played with them. Never really asked too many questions. Um, my mom's always been supportive, and I know families that aren't. Uh, but this wasn't what I expected growing up, and no, I've never really had a family. I haven't had a traditional family or anything close. Thanksgivings, you want to travel with two severely disabled kids for three, four hours just to go to a house that's not accessible? It doesn't really work. And when I try to have it at my house, which is fine, Thanksgiving, Passover, a large meal. How do I go shopping, cook, clean, and do all that while having the kid at home and arranging sitters and around the holidays? It's a challenge.